Andy for being uh, you know, kind enough to uh, come and uh, give us this talk uh, for today's. Uh, it's not going to be a monologue. I use that word. There's going to be a question and answer session, kind of, where I'll be asking questions and uh, Andy will be uh, answering. Um, I'd like to thank the Center uh, on Boss and Father. And then, of course, for uh, making this space available for us, as well as um, uh, Ms. Donna uh, Paris, who provided the uh, Um as well as uh, uh, the board of Melanie Link, who has been uh, uh, using its time uh, day after day. In order to put together these uh, these events, uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, I will start with. Uh, hope I didn't forget to thank you. Uh, I will start with uh, the days about the days talk. Uh, the title is "Best Ever: uh, State of the U.S. Greece Bilateral Relationship." Uh, as you I mentioned, uh, it will be Andy who will be uh, answering these questions. Uh, Andy is a information uh, about him. I think you probably won't know uh, who he is, but. Uh, Son of Crozer, speak closer to the mic. Crozer to the mic. Yes, uh, well, two things. Andy is the executive director of the Hellenic American Leadership Council now, a national Greek American advocacy organization. He oversees staff and fellows in Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., and leads the organization's advocacy effort at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as helps public education programs. Zemanidis is in the leadership circles of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Where he also was one of the uh, CCTA's Emerging Leaders Fellow. Um, now, uh, I'd like to say a few words about our next lecture. The next day is in March on March 17. It will be an online uh, lecture because the speaker is going to be from Athens, Greece. Um, the, uh, the title of the talk. Is the promotion in the West of the Greek struggle for independence 1891 1847? Uh, the uh, speaker will be uh, historian Dr. Nikos Um I think uh, uh, we have some applications in the back if anybody is interested to become a member. Uh, we can uh, use more members. Uh, and uh, uh, no other delay, I'd like uh, Andy to stand up. Or if you want to take that talk, all right, what do you think? As I said, this is going to be a, uh, a question and answer. And uh, this will be prepared by Andy and Costa. Costa, 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 Costa. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, a little louder. A little louder. Okay. I'm feeling it for Costa because he's uh, rather uh, he's in Florida. So, anyway, the first question is earlier this month in Washington, D.C., there were two important back to back events. For the Greece USA bilateral relationship, the fifth round of the US Greece strategic dialogue, and the fifth annual Southeast Europe and Eastern Mediterranean Forum, which called co host of Kathy Marini and the Delphi Economic Forum. Over the, that week, there was a lot of talk about the relationship being the best has ever been. Do you agree, and how can one objectively declare it as a best? So, first of all, thank you for 
So uh, thank you to Helen. That was exceptional program. Month by month, thank you to Father Dinama Hosa and St. Alamos uh, for hosting again. It is strange that we say best ever. They've been saying the best ever for five years. It's like you may remember some of you may remember it. It was initially rolled out by Ambassador Pike with the best ever, you know, with five years ago. And then four years ago, the best ever. Then three years ago, the best ever. So to to people who are not following closely, it may seem like hyperbole. Like those of us in Chicago, we know the best ever because we have Michael Jordan and we have most fans know what the best ever is. So then we have a lot of closer. But it is, it is best ever. It actually is getting better every year. It's uh, it's something that nobody would have guessed. I remember during the, the height of the economic crisis, we did a lecture <laughs> together, and nobody in 2017, nobody. And anybody here who says they guess this book will be, I know cannabis is legal. Because I see someone from Toronto here, but you've been smoking too much of it. If you think that this is where we're going to be, <laughs> uh, let's look at it from 2017 to today. What we have, that we can objectively measure. A couple of years ago, we signed a mutual defense and cooperation agreement right, that expanded basing rights in Greece for the United States. Now, some people say, "Oh, we know what the U.S. got." Greece, yet. Greece is definitely safer and more important uh, today because of it. But think about the geography. Look at the map. The stuff that we open the newspapers every day and you read about Ukraine and you read about God. And the bases that are most important for the United States today are the Southern for the Ukraine and Sudan for the greater Middle East and, and for the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, around the time we were talking about <clears throat> earlier this year, we had a historic weapons package. Uh, we, where Greece is going to get 40 F 35s. Again, going back to 2017 when we did this lecture, we didn't even know whether Greece was going to get the upgraded F 16s. Right? Now Greece is getting 80 upgraded F 16s, 40 F 35s. It's getting a minimum of $60 million in foreign military finance for decades, ever since Greece said, we're getting into the European common defense identity. For military financing has been a no no. Greece is getting 60, maybe up to 260. It's getting 60 Bradley tanks. And that's what, by the way, that 35 is what Greece is buying. Everything else I'm telling you is Greece being given, right? The money, the 60 Bradley tanks, the four littoral combat ships from the Navy. Two island class Coast Guard ships that are going to increase uh, in the migration crisis. Um, engines, two C 130s. And, and then what we learned, even right after, is that Greece is in the running uh, for constructing the Constellation class, the newest US frigate in Greece, because the US is not building any more shipyards, so they're looking for allies in this. But this is, this is not only going to help Greece at the Defense, but it's going to create a defense industry. This is going to help uh, Greece's economy. Um, we talked, we've long talked about here uh, economic investment from the US, and it used to be that even people here represented big, you know, big Greek, big American investments in Greece. In 2017, we actually had a reverse flow. We had more Greeks investing in the United States than we had Americans investing in Greece. But over the last two years, we've seen Pfizer, Oracle, Microsoft go and establish headquarters. JP Morgan Chase doing Vito Wallet. And, and very important with all of these is that they're also in Northern Greece. All of Greece. Uh, we've seen, Greece has always been a big tourist hub for all of us, but when we were growing up, there was a nice bed and breakfast. Maybe there was the Hilton, right? It wasn't the greatest Hilton. We are about to have a second Mandarin Oriental in Greece. They opened one this summer in, in uh, Cosa Navarino. There's they're going to open one in the Living Court. The, the, the Hilton, for those of you who've been in the center of Athens, is being converted to a Conrad Hilton. The Astero Palace is turned into a Four Seasons. Every big American brand and company is coming 
into Greece. Um, and finally, the, there's also, and this was huge related to the Council of Eastern Class, the American government is again pumping money into Greece. The Development Finance Corporation, which was part of something called the Build Act, which was the United States' response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, just poured in $125 million into the Plumbing Shipyards of NFC. So, um, of course, more people to people ties. We've had a record number of American tourists. Whereas when we went, when we left, when we spoke again using 2017 as a takeoff, there was one, one direct flight between the U.S. Uh, and Greece. We have two from Chicago starting this summer. We will have nine daily flights from May to October uh, from the U.S. Uh, more foreign study than ever, and high-level meetings. We've taken it for granted that uh, the Prime Minister of Greece comes to the White House. <laughs> He's going to come again within the next couple of months to the White House. That will be the fourth time since 2017 we've had a Prime Minister of the White House. Uh, the U.S. President Barack Obama's last trip was, uh, his last trip as president was to Greece. Pompeo went twice. Blinken had gone twice. So um, that's how you measure it. I don't think it, it's anybody who wants to argue with the importance of the Right. Before I move on, I forgot to say microphone. Microphone. Before I go on, I'd like to thank Barry Yanopoulos for helping us with the audio system the first time we had an event. I don't know if he's here or not, but uh, um, I right, uh, the next question this. Excellent state of relations is actually quite a turnaround, especially from the depths of the Greek economic crisis. What prompted this new era in the bilateral relationship? Uh, a lot of things, and let's start with the economic crisis. That was, that I would say, that came out of it. It came out of it because it created a, a significant maturity. Greek political sphere, which we'll get to later, it created a crisis. There was a political crisis too in in Europe because we all remember God rest his soul. I'm only saying that as a phenomenon. I hope God has not rest his soul. So the German finance minister showed me was trying to waterboard Greece as an example for others, but because Europe really misplayed. Economic crisis, America said. And when the history is fully written, we were very lucky that Jack Lou was the Secretary of Treasury at the time of the Greek economic crisis. And we're lucky not because, not only because he was a smart Wall Street guy, not only because he was a good Secretary of Treasury, but does anybody remember what Jack Lou was the day before he was Secretary of the Treasury? Does anybody remember? He was chief of staff of the White House. That means whenever he picked up the call from the secretary, usually a secretary calls and calls somebody in the White House to get the president's attention. Jack Lou was picking up and speaking directly to President Obama and Vice President Biden. And there is a famous European uh, Council meeting. This has actually been reported on the Financial Times and others where Tsipras and his team were upstairs with, with, with uh, the European leaders and all the other European, with the uh, European Union leaders and all the other prime ministers and foreign ministers were downstairs. And we just saw yelling and the door open and the Greeks leave. And everybody thought that's it. The Greeks are crashing out of Euro. It's this and that. And Somebody runs up and says, give him a phone call, give him a cell phone, there was Jack Lou, and he says, go in there and make a deal. I promise you the United States will not let you strap. That changed, that changed everything. Right? Um, then the US became, for the first time, more popular in Europe. At the same time, we had Russia became a Up until 2014, and Russia's invasion of Crimea, I haven't thought 
Crown Wolf to say the Russia. And when when Syriza came in, you can go and look up all US newspapers, and everybody said the Greeks are gonna mess up European unity and Russia. Later they were saying that about the Cypriot, not they just now about two Soviet meetings because they tried to use it to, to make him lose. Uh, but but Syriza uh, held the line. Uh, help the line on European unity in Russia. So Greece, um, Greece not only exceeded up uh, expectations on Russia, but turned out to be an active foe um, um, against Russia. We see, we see, now we see it in the case of the Ukrainian uh, Church uh, and in the Balkans. Israel, uh, and this has both there and here, but uh, the, the alliance between Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and the Greek American community, American Jewish community, changed the perception of Greece in, in the United States. Uh, China, again, tied to the economic crisis. The Germans, remember, were telling them, Greece, you gotta sell everything, you gotta sell this. And because they forced the Greeks to sell the AI, and they forced them, and no American, no European bidders did. Even the backup bidder was Chinese. That woke up the Americans to say, oh, something's going wrong. In fact, in a follow up sale that I think he has found key, because it was particularly important, not only was that the, the national insurance company, it was the largest shareholder in the National Bank of Greece. Now, originally, there was a Greek American, uh, it was Capital Industries with the Dutch consortium that was given the, the winning bid. That fell apart because the Dutch put it out. But uh, they never rebid it because the second, third, and fourth bid were Chinese. Right? And this is why you see things like the LFC now shipyards. Energy, we saw this first with Cyprus and then Greece. We used to joke around if we started shipping oil instead of olive oil. People yeah, well, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, but our energy becomes so gas. Yes, energy is becoming no renewables. In fact, in this conference you talked about, some of the Balkan ambassadors and, and the Moldovan ambassadors said if it wasn't for Greece last winter, Southeast Europe would have frozen. Greece fortunately had a mild winter, so it could export a lot of its gas. You've seen the interconnectors with. With Bulgaria, the interconnectors with Skopje. Uh, just this week, I think at the beginning of this week, we had a major unloading of cargo and then that's like total lease because we, we, we put a, a second uh, floating regasification unit. And then but that's a context, but I'm still a big believer in history, the right people being in the right place at the right time. And like I said, Jack Lou was important. Kiriakos Mutsadakis being prime minister at a time when you know, uh, Erdogan is trying to prove everybody that he was a main character in Gaiatosis, or that uh, his real sickness was not cancer but schizophrenia. Right? Uh, he had uh, Mutsadakis, for example, for Zakaria, who was on Bloomberg. Who can? I was in the room with him in the speech in Congress. I'm telling you, you, would, you could not have been more positive. Right? To watch the Greek Prime Minister get 12 standing ovations and to be speaking to them in a way, you know, not like when my guy is just, he's like, I'm George, I'm <laughs> uh, And uh, uh, you know, Anastasiadis in Cyprus, you know, the, the Greeks kept, and I will say this, Tsipras in Greece. Tsipras broke a lot of taboos for the left. And now when you're watching what Tsipras is saying, thank God we have Tsipras in the uh, But, well, um, since you mentioned the sale of F-35 to Greece, since you mentioned the sale of F-35 to Greece, let's talk about, uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, let's talk about the associated F-16 sale to Turkey. Uh, what are the latest developments of this front? And are these any real safeguards 
are there any real safeguards that they will not be used in any way against Greece or Cyprus? So uh, this is also, I'll go back to starting in 2017, since we, we put 2017 as, as the, the measuring point. Think about where we were in 2017. In 2017, Greece did not even have one contract for a single upgrade in F-16. Our fleet was falling apart. We were five years into austerity, and Turkey had a contract for 100 F-35s, not F-16s. Think about that. Think about that in reality, these the overflights and the challenges of Greek sovereignty should be happening with the second biggest F 35 fleet in the world. Of course, we launched a campaign uh, with a big coalition of American Jews, Armenian Americans, Kurds, evangelical Christians, and Middle Eastern Christians who have been extremely helpful and Hindu Americans. Uh, and and I will say over the last five years, the best partner we could possibly have is Turkey. Every time we score a little victory, they get really upset. So they dig in deeper. And that's not how you negotiate uh, with the United States. Uh, the re originally, what we wanted with them to define is conditions. We didn't think nowhere in our mind they were in a block at 35. They were actually in the production consortium. So we thought, can we get in these conditions? Congress thought that was a reasonable ask, went to Turkey, made that demand, and the Turkish ambassador yeah, he basically reacted like Taki Tsukalas, said that they yeah. So that made Congress even more upset. And they went on and went on, and Turkey insisted on, on the S 400s. Uh, and then our allies in Congress kept passing more legislation and more legislation. And finally, Turkey got expelled. Uh, while that was happening, Greece upgraded its F 16s. And then now we have flipped the equation. There's a lot of bad people in this room. I've seen they live to, to the days where the post Cyprus days, and even the new hack days, when we've got a 7 to 10, and how we do this very well, a 7 to 10 ratio. You know, we got $7 for every 10 that Turkey got. Right? And that was a, considered a great success. We have completely flipped that. We're getting money they're getting nothing. We're getting F 35 they're getting nothing. And even, even if they get all the F 16s, even if there's a big question mark, and I get to that, we still have a qualitative military badge. If they have 80 upgraded F 16s at the end of the day, we have 80 upgraded F 16s. We have 40 F 35s, they have nothing like that. We also have the 24 F 5s, right? And we have five American bases in Greece. Now, uh, what are the safeguards? Let's also remember and accomplish something that, <coughs> especially due to the Philippines and Congress, that nobody has ever seen. A seven year hold on any Turkish, any weapons in Turkey. That's not just a Turkey. No NATO member has ever gone through a seven year hold. We used to joke about it, the, the data no defeated. Seven years. That, think, compare that, for example, when, because we all say the great gold standard is the American Jewish community, the pro Israel community, and Israel. Israel said we don't want Saudi Arabia to get F 35. What happened? Saudi Arabia got F 35. So, right? We were able to put a seven year hold and then also achieve something. And again, this is mostly thanks to. Chairman Menendez and Chairman Greg Meeks, or Ranking Member Meeks in the House, that the State Department, because nobody was going to believe in Erdogan's promise on what was going to be achieved, right? nobody was going to believe in Akron's promise. So Congress required the State Department to guarantee to Congress that if this offending behavior begins, I mean, those of you who may read on the media, maybe read the letter last week, that there is a letter from Secretary William to House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that says these jets are not to be used to challenge the sovereignty, not to be used to, for overflights. Actually, it says to any NATO sovereignty, but of course, we don't challenge Turkish sovereignty, we challenge ours, so we are that. And if that behavior resumes, 
then, then the State Department has promised Congress a series of steps. The diplomatic initiative, and if the diplomatic initiative does not work, a suspension in whole, or suspension or cancellation in whole or in part of the sale. So at the end of the day, for Turkey to get that entire F-16 deal, they will have had to think about the year ago exactly, like what's the 25th. Like two days, Friday marked one year since overflights stopped. If we get four more years of no overflights, when we last spoke, would anybody would bet there was any scenario where we get five years of no overflights? No. So, Since we're talking about F-35, the other day was the test flight of the that's Khan, I think they call it Khan, yeah. which is supposed to be a fifth generation uh, uh, fighter jet. And uh, that was on Facebook, and uh, the Turks were all excited about it. And they said, uh, impressive, but it's just a shell. It's an old engine. <laughs> There's nothing else in it, probably, right? Well, it is, but clearly they had to do something because Erdogan is getting hit by the opposition and Greeks are making up great fights on the road in F-16s. And the Greeks already have Rafats. So they put an F-16 engine in this plane. This plane was not designed for an F-16 engine. It was designed for an F-35 engine. And, and they put it up. So as I, you know, the, the best comparison is that the, the Turkish platform for their jet was, was based on the F-35 plane. That's why you have to be in the consortium. So, okay, people know this, Lexus and Toyota are the same color, right? But you're not gonna take a Lexus shell all of a sudden and start putting Toyota parts in it. Theoretically, it'll still work, but it's not a Lexus. That's what it's theoretically. Um, part of the American uh, logic for proceeding with F-16 sales was the moderation of Erdogan's aggressive stance against Greece. Now the dialogue is on between Greece and Turkey. Is this moderation since this year or everything? Everything Erdogan does is opportunistic. <laughs> uh, the, the only thing uh, that Erdogan is sincere about is expanding. He wants to be bigger than the Turk. He wants a uh, Political Islamist uh, rule in, in not only in Turkey but in the region. But more importantly, he realized that his hostility towards Greece became a, a real problem for him in Washington, in Brussels, in France, in Jerusalem, and in Cairo. Uh, he tried a lot of things before he finally moderated towards Greece. I mean, I'm amused because only a few months before it, he was like, it's a lucky school. I don't know. It's a lucky school. My good friend, Kim Yakos, right? This is why I call him since I tried to do it. And it, it became a problem for him in, in Washington, especially because Congress likes Greece. Even, even, even though there's a narrative that, you know, State Department is more pro Turkey, that's not true. State Department doesn't know what to do with Turkey. They still want to fix that relationship, but the State Department has been increasingly becoming closer to Greece. Greece has proven itself over and over again. Greece has gone from five years ago when Ambassador Pilot calling it a pillar of stability to during the strategic dialogue. Both ambassador Tunis and then Secretary Blinken calling it an indispensable ally. Uh, so he knew he had to do something. He's a master, he's outgoing ambassador, actually, and the Greek ambassador did a courtesy call. Uh, he told me, you know what the my biggest problems in Washington was just the Greek Americans. Because for the first time, we're also going back to what prompted. We changed how we look. We don't. Those of you who are on our email this moment, we almost never do something all this out. We do it with American Jewish community, or we do it with the Armenian National Committee, we do it with American friends of Kurdistan. We have built a, a, a coalition uh, and 
also the think tankers who are very critical of Turkey. You, you saw all of them. And they're also going to go to Delphi, right? So the, we broadened our reach, and uh, you know, I'm tired that Erdogan complained about me by name. I'm an enemy of the state. <laughs> uh, where does this dialogue stand now? So what happens roughly, very consistently, is some military to military dialogue. That's headed by diplomats. Some of them remember for Ambassador Lalagos, uh, who was the Greek ambassador to Washington, now in the foreign ministry, and he's working on confidence building measures. But one of the reasons the situation in the Aegean was very dangerous, there was not even a There was no hotline. If there was an accident, we're lucky that there was an accident because it would have escalated very quickly. So they're establishing those hotlines, they're establishing procedures for what if a fisherman from Turkey goes really close to Igari, right? Uh, those are, there is a political dialogue coming up uh, that's going to be headed by former ambassador and now deputy minister of There is some economic kind of dialogue that deputy foreign minister of that is doing and that will lead to another upcoming, I think in the spring, we are signing between the Prime Minister and the Any indications that this dialogue will lead to some more permanent positive outcomes? I don't think so. I think the problem is there on. I think he's trying to buy time, but at least calm for Greece, calm is a uh, to have calm right now is a There may be a breakthrough, though. Right, right. And you may have a military leader saying, come on, guys, no more Blue Homeland, because a Blue Homeland is definitely a building construct. You don't know, but talking under calm um, circumstances is better than talking under pressure. Um, so calm is a way. Just want to ask, what's the steps of the S4 members? Are they, I think they're not uh, ready to deploy right now. They, well, they're ready to deploy, but they're not operational. They keep them in a box. They keep them in a box only because they know that if they deploy them, they'll get more sanctions. Are any, are any indications that Turkey will accept the salute the resolution? Issues that cannot be resolved by negotiations. Do you refer to the international call for justice? Not under the circumstances that they should. They keep saying, yes, we'll go to the International Court of Justice, but we want to reorder the Mosaic. We want to put the Turkish minority, the Muslim minority, they call it the Turkish minority, in its race up. Those are those are not. Acceptable conditions for Greece and not acceptable conditions for the Greek American community. Uh, I echo the Prime Minister's position and the Foreign Minister's position that the only issue at stake with Turkey is the delineation of the maritime border. We would all want to go into the ICJ, but if Turkey keeps insisting on those extra conditions, we won't go. Now, the good thing is. Nobody is back, nobody, not, nobody in Europe, nobody in the United States is backing that extra, those extra conditions. Uh, is Turkey shown any moderation in the stance for Cyprus? No, no, that, that's, it actually got even worse. It got even worse on Cyprus. They, uh, this summer, some of you may have seen it, but, Turkey actually attacked UN peacekeeping. They're on in the in the buffer zone. Um, I have a guilty admission to give the father, but I was so happy that it was British peacekeepers that ended up in the hospital yeah. because I think the British uh, were responsible for everything going wrong in Cyprus. Uh, but um, so they, they actually resorted to violence. They have a lot of more underplayed. I don't think we give enough attention to this. It's every day Turkey tries to take 
another move in the buffer zone. So the buffer zone, so we're all clear, is that it's it's officially the Republic of Cyprus territory. It's not even occupied territory. The Republic of Cyprus has given the United Nations the jurisdiction to work on every day, every day. And that we have a problem. They're trying to inch it. Uh, Erdogan's puppet, Tatar, who is a Turkish Supreme Leader, leader of the Sudo state, says we don't accept the UN resolutions as a basis for a Cyprus negotiation. Uh, he says they want two states, that if they want, if, if they want them to come back from the table, we have to agree to two equal states. No, they, they have to come worse. Um, but what we learned with FCE and Sweden scenario is that this idea of their, that has existed in the West for years, if you handle everything with the term time closed doors, they're quite close. No, you smack them around a little bit in public and they have real consequences. But they'll come to the table. Now it's interesting because I know when Victoria Nolan went to Turkey, the Turkish foreign minister has said, hey, we need your help to get invited to a meeting of foreign ministers in Europe. So the next day, the Turkish, the, the super foreign minister vetoed the Turkish request. Right? Cyprus has a veto. But Greece has a veto in the EU. And they also have a veto in other bodies like the Eastern Gas Forum, where Turkey wants to be Turkey if they really want to get to it. They have a cynical role, they think we're going to fall for it, like in years past. They want to put Greco Turkish stuff here, and they want to put Cyprus here. They don't understand that it's not going to be separated, not by Kiriakos, Mitsubakis, and not by What do you think about the Secretary of Law? Victoria Nolan? Yeah. You know, I actually would say she's been a pleasant surprise. Because she came in there, everybody said, oh, she's going to be anti-Greek. She, in, in this military package of getting Greece greater uh, attention in the U.S., she, she has been <coughs> an ally on that. I think she's, she still gives, she's, she's still <coughs> kind of a velvet glove with Turkey, a little more than I would like. But, uh, you know, I know, I know she has this uh, reputation of villain, which I think is <coughs> wrong from her first, her first go around and her mother doing the Obama with this. But she's she's been better than I expected. It was a low bar. She's not better. Than that. She's clear. I heard. Who's that? Victoria Nolan, who's the she is the number three in the State Department. Um, how will the stepping down of uh, Menendez from the chairmanship of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee affect negatively Greece and Cyprus? Uh, what can be said about the new leadership of the committee? Well, when you, when you lose your best friend and who, who knew, definitely knew the issues better than anybody here, I would say, even including myself, it can't be good. But this is one where we have to be, we have to have so much gratitude for her. What he did was not over four years, it was over 30 years. And he has changed the direction of US foreign policy in our region. Uh, it wasn't you know, a couple of statements or a couple of floor speeches. He passed two pieces of legislation which are the cornerstone of US foreign policy in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, I had people read it and say Menendez Rubio 1 and Menendez Rubio 2, but it's the Eastern Mediterranean Security and Energy Partnership Act and the US Greece Defense and Interparliamentary Partnership Act. Things that we just talked about, whether it's a, the expansion of basic rights, money for Greece, F 35s, would never happen without that legislation. Um, there are other, you know, how come Chris Van Connor is playing a great role here locally, Brad Schneider, who's taken over. The Hellenic Israel Alliance Caucus. Um, but, you know, yes, more people have to step 